Yes, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure. So I'm deeply grateful to BRK for this invitation. And I have to say that probably I come as a sort of dissonance because I, I will address some things from a philosophical perspective. But in any case, we we're, we're all speak about Europe, and I think that Europe is a huge thing which has many dimensions, and one of them could be well articulated from a philosophical perspective. So in any case, I would like to start by saying that we all live in different political historical time zones. So I think it would be a banality to suggest that Ukraine lives elsewhere in terms of its political and historical time zone. We know in Europe that we put behind such things as the nation building processes or the era of nationalism, which was very much of the 19th century and its content. But for some nations and peoples in Europe, it is still something ahead of them. So that's why we cannot take it for granted. So, and at the same time, these different political historical time zones were partly overcome due to the EU. Symbolically, I remember it was suggested that when uh, Mr. Buzek, uh, Mr. Buzek has become president of the European Parliament, it indicated probably a sort of victory over these east-west divisions in Europe, because that was for the first time that a Polish policymaker has become a central figure in the European Parliament. But this is very much of a symbolic thing, and we know that the European Parliament, like the EU itself, is very much of an elite project in the eyes of flesh and blood human beings in Europe. So that's why I would suggest that east-west divisions are still there, and I can tell you why. Let me remind you of a groundbreaking uh, essay by Milan Kundera, which was written in 1984, and the essay was titled The Tragedy of Central Europe. Milan Kundera by then suggested that by Eastern Europe, West Europeans mean very different countries. In fact, some of them have little to do in terms of their locality and even history. And Eastern Europe is more of a political designation than a sort of concept which could be somehow explained using cultural affinity or historical horizon. So that's why Kundera says, if we take Prague as a city, it is more westwards than Vienna. But we know that Prague is Eastern Europe and Vienna is the West. So to continue on the same note, I would suggest that several other um, examples could uh, indicate how deeply opposed to the logic and conventional wisdom these things is. In fact, it has nothing to do with geography. We know that Bratislava is 60 kilometers away from Vienna, but for a long time Bratislava was Eastern Europe and Vienna was Western Europe. In fact, neither are there, so they are central European cities unimaginable without one another. But so it happened that Vienna indicated the West, whereas Bratislava, which was in the vicinity and was always be there, it was the East. And the same applies to the Baltic states. I still remember a trip from Tallinn, Estonia to Helsinki, Finland, 70 kilometers, which was the distance between Tallinn and Helsinki, indicated civilizational distance between the East and the West. So geographically, it wouldn't make any sense to divide them this way. But from the point of view of symbolic or political geography, the logic imposed by the Cold War worked quite well. So that's why I would say that Europe still has this touch of divisions which have nothing to do with geography. Instead, it is about the Cold War divisions or the Iron Curtain, which deeply which was deeply embedded in the consciousness of Europeans. At the same time, I would like to touch upon uh, one more phenomenon. Uh, when we take it for granted that with the EU, all of those things disappeared, so I would put this into question. I think that there are many indications that still uh, Eastern and Central Europe remain quite troubled when it comes to their perception in the West. We know that Milan Kundera produced beautiful characters. In the Book of Laughter and Forgetting, we remember a Czech woman, Tamina, who lives in France, and we remember she is separated from her memory in a way because when her husband dies, she finds herself very lonesome in France, and she is separated from her diaries, which are left 
in Prague, and she's unable to connect herself to her intimacy, to her memory. She's separated. That's why she engages in a meaningless love affair with a French man, only to be able to make expensive telephone calls to Prague, to her parents. And finally, she desperately tries to regain, to regain her diaries, and she fails. And finally, having found herself separated from her intimacy, memory, she is unable to collect herself and she commits suicide. So it's a very telling character of a Central European who is simply unqualified to live in the West, only because there is the deep, deep divide inside her or him in terms of the perception of the country, personality, and in a way, even powers of association which are deeply troubled. Let me touch upon Mr. Anonymous. So it's, in a way, it's a metaphor, and needless to say, this is a metaphor which means globalization, of course, but globalization in the sense of Sigmund Bauman. It's about human consequences. It's not about structures, supranational, supranational structures, institutions. It's about human consequences. The question would be, what happened to us due to globalization? And what happened to us is that, in a way, many things have changed our character, many things have changed our conduct. In a way, we find ourselves quite alienated from the outcome of our projects. The European Union, please don't get me wrong, I celebrate it because I'm very much pro-European and pro-EU person, but in a way, what strikes me is that there are many ways to perceive and describe the EU. For some people, it is a very ambitious project. For others, it's something that could be described in terms of inevitability. It's the bare necessity in the age of globalization. For others, this is something profoundly European in terms of the concert of European sensitivities, history, cultures, the sense of affinity. For some people, it's about how to survive because they're starving in their countries. Finally, the EU is, for some people, an elite club and it's very difficult for them to qualify for that club. For the Baltic states, it's been a dream, it's been an ambition, the countries qualified there, and the year 2004 has become the turning point in the history of the Baltic states. You know that my country lost independence, and it was several times that these countries found herself just hostages and puppets into the hands of really mighty countries and institutions. But having said this, I have to say that when we became members of the EU and NATO, then we understood that for some other countries that were almost in the same cell of that same prison for decades. For them, the EU is something ahead of them. Take Ukraine, take Moldova or Georgia. They are in the same shoes that we were standing in in the 90s. They try to find the light at the end of the tunnel. It's very difficult and that's why the EU, which we take for granted, appears as a miracle as a great, great dream for them. So, there are many ways to perceive it, and yet, I'm tempted to remember George Soros. Uh, George Soros started writing quite curious and polemical writings in the New York Review of Books, and it was over past five or six months that it came up with very interesting opinions concerning the fate of the EU. For instance, he wrote that one of the paradoxes of the European Union is that it was designed, it was dreamed of as a deeply egalitarian phenomenon. The EU was about freedom, equality, equality of nations, countries, but what happened instead, according to Soros, incidentally, himself very pro-European and feeling very strongly about the EU. According to Soros, what happened to the EU was a sort of paradox, almost the Hegelian paradox or historical irony. When you wake up in the morning, after the French Revolution, and you clearly see that the monarchy is dead, but still it's not the Republic. Something is missing there. So it's something like the Hegelian sense of irony. And according to Soros, what happened was that we thought that that would be about equality. All of a sudden, we ended up in a new hierarchical organization. According to him, the EU is a hierarchical organization which works in the guise of egalitarian one, because what kind of equality can be, he asks, between states' creditors and states' debtors? It's not about equality, as simple as that. So technically, it's not about equality, but Soros says it takes much 
optimism, willpower, faith, and that's why he believes that if Germany steps in as a benign hegemon, the way the United States was after the Second World War, if the European states inject more optimism, everything could end well. But what I'm saying is that, you see, we could offer a certain university course in how could we deal almost ethnographically or anthropologically with the EU. There are many ways to describe it. And needless to say, uh, if I put aside more polemical tone, of course I would start celebrating the EU, and quite rightly so. There are many good reasons to do so, and I think that in, in the end of my paper I will try to sound more optimistic. But in the meantime, I would like to touch on something more um, problematic. And namely, what happened was that we found ourselves in the world which Zygmunt Bauman and myself I mentioned Zygmunt, he is a man of genius, a great sociologist, but he's a beloved friend. And we wrote one book on moral blindness and the loss of sensitivity, and we are in the process of finishing, finalizing our next book on TINA, which is the acronym for There is No Alternative. It's a kind of loss of alternative, and TINA, which sounds like the name of a beloved woman, like a sweetheart, but in fact it was an acronym applied by Maggie Thatcher for the first time. There is no alternative. And then it was with much irony that some sociologists simply put it uh, as a, a metaphor of the absence of free choice and alternative. There is no alternative. What does it mean? According to Bauman, Tina indicates the new liquidity of evil. According to him, this is about privatization, dissemination, deregulation. Take universities, take culture, take many things, and the answer could be that assume responsibility. You are free. Act. And then the question would be if you have an incompetent state which doesn't know how to act, how on earth can you require of individual to act up? How can you require that she or he would accept responsibility and to solve problems that were produced globally and not individually. This is the question posed by Ulrich Beck and then Bauman. Is it fair to require that individuals assume responsibility for the problems they never produced themselves? Can we require to assume responsibility for global problems that can be solved only globally? That's the question. I would add that there are some other dimensions here concerning Mr. Anonymous or Mr. Big Anonymous. I would say that we are suffering from certain cognitive dissonance. We are celebrating economic heterogeneity. Of course, we need more emigration. We need more heterogeneity, or as Bauman says, we need more heterophilia. We celebrate Indian Chinese restaurants. As long as we have diversity in terms of boutique multiculturalism, as Stanley Fish says, we are happy. The problem comes during the time of crisis, when all of a sudden we start thinking about cultural homogeneity. How to fulfill a new dream of populism to combine economic heterogeneity with cultural homogeneity? We all speak the same language, we all have the same memory, we all have the same sentiment, we all have the same culture, but when it comes to economy, we're all different. So, and this is one of dissonances that I would take as quite troubled. Another thing is the sense of Tina produces the new sense of determinism. Our epoch is quite fatalistic, pessimistic, and deterministic, to say the least, with panic mongering, scaremongering, apocalyptic visions. And if we compare the 21st century to the 18th or 19th, we would find the striking difference. Theirs was an epoch of deep belief, almost romantic belief in human ability to change the course of history, to build up a biography, to have le projet de la vie, as the French would say. Ours is an epoch when we deeply believe that there are social forces beyond our reach and our control. Nothing can be done about it. It's just Tina. There is no alternative. This phenomenon was described by one sociologist who was my mentor and friend, a Lithuanian-American sociologist, Vito Taskavolis, as the culture of determinism. And according to him, this determinism um, signifies um, belief that there are social forces that we can never affect, we can never control them. Like Sigmund Freud, who suggested that biology is destiny, we could say the economy is destiny. 
nowadays. On the other side, it is a belief that our life is nothing other than just a sort of totality of pleasure maximizing, utility pleasure maximizing efforts and instruments. And if we fail this project, this means that suffering and pain are not about the essence of human life. At the same time, it is a belief that competence and expertise should rule the world, which is to say that democracy starts parading, or instead, technocracy starts parading as democracy, because we relate to our politicians as patients re rely on medical doctors or experts. It's very much the same. The relationship remains the same, which means that determinism means the myth of expertise. It's not about freedom. It's the, it's the myth of expertise which comes instead. So that's why apocalyptic fears, scaremongering, pessimism, anxiety, new forms of angst are all manifestations of this new culture of determinism. This is exactly what I would call Mr. Anonymous. What are the consequences? The consequences are that what we have on the ground is populism, which is not just, you know, a sort of, you know, clowning or buffoonery in politics. No, it is a very subtle and very multidimensional art of translation of private fears into public affairs. People fear many things. All of a sudden, we have people, we may call them political clowns, but they are the great masters of how to translate our hidden fears into public discourses and public affairs. At the same time, we have some other disturbing things. Not only populism, but we have uh, some new divisions and new difficult choices. And I'm turning to this third segment. Oh, it's very beautiful here, I have to say. <laughs> Thank you, Bjarke. Sounds quite, it sounds like, Dan it looks like Dansk, like solidarity movement in many ways. So dilemmas of freedom, they are inevitable when it comes to our new realities. Um, now we're now we're talking with very good reason about migration, our sensitivity, and of course, how can you be heartless and soulless in the face of the fact that people are, people are, you know, drowning and people are dying, trying to reach desperately the coast of Italy. And, but at the same time, I have to say that migration, in a way, reflects very deep divisions inside the EU and among EU countries. Take some countries with very high degree of migration, like Latvia or Lithuania. There were many debates whether or not it is for the better or for the worse of the country. Over the past 15 years, more than half a million people emigrated from Lithuania to other European countries. Please don't get me wrong, I'm not singing a funeral song to my country, but the fact remains that Lithuania has always been quite migration-oriented country. Prior to the Second World War, there were many Lithuanians who were living for the United States, for South America. And we know that Lithuania, a small country, has a huge diaspora in the United States. Chicago used to be called Lithuania outside of Lithuania. So it's a very Greek, Polish, and Lithuanian city. But I have to say that the character of migration started changing and, well, uh, there is not a single reason that could allow to compare Lithuania in the 20th century to Lithuania now. Lithuania is as safe, secure as it never been before. But still, more than half a million people, young people, who leave the country. The question would be, what are the gains and the losses? What are the benefits and the losses of the country in this process? On the one side, we are talking about new Europeans. Didn't we call Europe our home? Well, they are at home. Although Mr. Cameron is going to question this right of Eastern and Central Europeans to find themselves at home in the UK. But still, it was a promise. Has it been promised that we're all at home in Denmark, Sweden, Greece, Italy? At the same time, probably they're trying to fill the gaps or trying to create new niche for people who would create pan-European public discourse, as my colleague has suggested. But at the same time, it is obvious that small countries are at risk of losing people who would be able to create the new political atmosphere, the new public domain in their respective country. And I have to say that this sort of migration, which is quite close to exodus, even produced very interesting pieces of art. Uh, you know, Lithuania is quite strong in, in theater, 
It's a theater country. And I guess that you know the name of Oscar Skorosunovas, who has much success in Denmark, Sweden, France. And he staged the play of Marius Ivashkevich's The Expulsion, about the life of uh, Lithuanians, um, illegal aliens in the UK in the late 90s. And this is really surprising to see that these people find themselves second class, second rank people who are in no man's land. They are nowhere. So if we need an ethnographic study about how people from South America or North Africa would feel in Europe, you can drop it. Just take Eastern Europeans. And people from EU countries who find themselves very much in the same way and in the same shoes. So that's why it's, uh, I wouldn't say hypocritical, I'm not trying to moralize ourselves, but um, I would say that it's a little bit, you know, contradictory to describe this as a kind of EU vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world phenomenon. It's not that way. It's very much of a European and global phenomenon at one and the same time. So this is a very difficult question. The dilemma of freedom number one is, should I be a successful consumer or a citizen? If I'm a successful consumer, probably I fulfill the promise and even live up to the expectations of many people who promised the EU function that way. We're all successful consumers. You remember, it's just like from the famous Monty Python film, Life of Brian. You are all individuals, yeah, except one. I am not. <laughs> so, yeah, we are all consumers. You are all loyal and successful consumers. But what if I want to be a citizen, accepting very difficult dilemmas of my country and trying to refurbish, renovate the political class, the academia, something other that badly needs me and my participation. So it's a very difficult dilemma, and this allows me to step uh, to the final phase of my talk. And I have to say that this would be Bjarke if I have some three, four minutes. Yep, with me. That would be on the optimistic note. I could tell you that this Mr. Big Anonymous, Europe and the Dilemmas of Freedom are not only about my grim, somber and pessimistic visions. No, not at all. In fact, I would be quite optimistic talking about absolutely new instruments and new possibilities uh, allowed by the EU. First and foremost, as an academic, I would celebrate uh, student exchange programs and Erasmus Mundus. Uh, my experience in Bologna, where I taught for many years and still teach there, so taught me a very important lesson. I remember what was happening when I had uh, students from Kosovo, Kosovo Albanians, Kosovars, and Serbian students in my class during extremely difficult times they had among themselves. And I have to say that it would have been impossible to bring the political classes of the, those countries in the same facility but it was possible to listen to a very civilized and inspiring discussion at the university class. Or, for instance, I remember Georgian-Russian war in 2008. It would have been impossible to imagine anyone from Mikhail, Mikhail Saakashvili and his entourage sitting and discussing things with Russians. But it was possible to listen to students who discussed those things peacefully. And this brought me to an idea that they are the political class of the future. Because I know that institutionally and politically, the EU is very imperfect. It's deemed to be imperfect. But it can compensate its imperfections precisely trying to promote the pan-European public domain and especially academic programs. Because where the technical and political Europe fails, the cultural and academic Europe may prevail. This is to say that we should work with alternatives alternatives for the future. And this is the bright side of Europe. Concerning Erasmus Mundus, I will end on the joke, on the very major note expressed by Umberto Eco. Eco said, I love Erasmus Mundus to the extent that I would be happy to extend Erasmus Mundus to taxi drivers, <laughs> working class people. They should have their Erasmus Mundus for the benefit of Europe. And I would say that putting aside some metaphors that sometimes happen to be futile, like European citizens. If you don't bring more content to this concept, it may appear as quite futile and empty. But in fact, when you think about Erasmus Mundus and people who sit together trying to imagine their lives 
which are unimaginable for present political classes, I would say that this is exactly what European citizenship means about its new moral and political imagination, which the EU badly needs. Thank you.